Welcome to the Thriving Mayor Show, the weekly broadcast featuring former and current mayors who are thriving, sharing their story, insight, wisdom, and viewpoint. Join us and comment on social media as we meet another of the superheroes we elect to lead the rejuvenation of our towns and cities and who serve us all. Visit www.thrivingmayor.com to learn more. Here we go. Hi, everybody. It's Michael Hubicki, the host of The Thriving Mayor Show. It's May 5th, 2021, and I'm super excited today to have as a special guest on the show, the president of Durham College in Oshawa, Ontario, Don Leviza. Hello, Don. How are you today? Hello, Mike. I, I, I was fascinated by your introduction because I wasn't elected. I was hired. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I just want everyone to know that uh, I have to be on my best behavior because Don is my president, mm. being the uh, the head coach of the men's volleyball team at Durham College. So it's uh, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit about that. But uh, yeah, fantastic, fantastic uh, institution. Thanks. We'll Mike. begin. I just want to also mention that this show ha- was pre-recorded on May third, and you're welcome to post comments uh, during the broadcast on May fifth, and we'll do our best to respond to those. We'll begin this episode by honoring the Aboriginal land and the Indigenous peoples who've lived here from the beginning. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, we honor the ancestors of the land, the Anishinaabek, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Ojibwe Chippewa peoples. This territory is covered by the Williams Treaty. Tatalia Michelle Nahani taught me about honoring our shared community with the land and people. I'll just read a quick bio uh, for Don here. Being president is a position Don has held for the past 13 years of his more than 30 years in post-secondary education. In this position, Don leads a talented group of more than 2,300 full and part-time employees. I'm one dedicated to leading the way. Durham College has thrived under LaVisa's leadership, growing to more than 13,800 full-time, post-secondary and apprentice students and over 30,000 students in total. Don is considered a leader in the college system and the broader provincial and national community. He is currently on numerous boards and takes great pride in Durham College being recognized as a top, as a GTA, top employer and one of Canada's greenest employers. He has a master's degree in international management, a bachelor of arts degree in sociology, a diploma in adult education, and has completed his coursework for a PhD in community college leadership. Uh, Welcome again, Don. Super thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure being here. Awesome, awesome. And I just want, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've coached at a few different post-secondary institutions in Ontario, and Durham College is is just by far uh, my favorite, and and provides such an amazing student experience and student athlete experience, as well as as being a coach. The uh, facilities, the administration, the support, the fans, uh, the social media—it's all uh, it's all second to none, and and uh, really leading. And and I I know that that. It, it all it, it kind of trickles up from the bottom, but it really from the top down as well. And and your leadership, not I think, is is uh, is a is a, a huge uh, a contributor to that experience that that we as staff and and the students experience. And and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. You know, I appreciate that, Mike. I mean, the varsity and and athletics in Durham is just part of the DNA. It has the way years before I came. Right. And so it's a foundation that I just need to continue to support. But, you know, Ken Babcock and his team, I mean, they do such a fabulous job. And to just get the students riled up, for all of us to appreciate how valuable it is to have varsity in sport. And, and as you know, for many students, if it wasn't so for sport, they wouldn't be at the college. That's you know, right. It draws students. It helps them be successful. It's part of their life. So it's really part of the overall idea of keeping students engaged. And, uh, and it's also a great, a lot of fun watching the sports too. And we've done well, really well. Well, last well the, the last year before COVID, I think we had two or three national champions. Uh, our team went to the national championship. We were silver in the province. A number of other silver and, and bronze medalists. And 
Uh, it was it was a fantastic year. Yeah, men's soccer, women's softball. I mean, you guys did well. Everybody did. I mean, men's baseball. Did well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And another reason why I'm really excited about um, having Don and Ryan on the show today is being a retired landscape architect. Many, many of my projects had the opportunity, which I always promoted, to include urban agriculture and trying to secure local food uh, distribution and production and things like that and, and accessibility, social equity in our landscapes, which is, is so, so, so important. And this new initiative that uh, that is being um, able to come to fruition with the Barrett fa family's generous donation is really, really exciting. And uh, I can't wait to hear more of it. So Don, can you tell us a little bit about the Barrett family and um, how that came came to be? Yes, you know, we're, we're, we're thrilled. We're honored that the Barrett's have invested so much into Durham College to help us realize a vision that we've had for a few years. So if I may just back up a few years, you know, we, when, when I first became a president, um, soon realized that we didn't have any hospitality programs. We didn't have any, um, any agricultural programs, but here we lived in the center of an agricultural area. Yeah. We started listening to the community and we developed the vision around the Center for Food, which is an umbrella that supports, you know, food and farming and horticulture and culinary and hospitality, vet management, and, and also food science, which we had, we've had for 40 some years. And it was that initial vision that we wanted to demonstrate that we could do something unique. Mm. Unique for our students, giving them a, a, a real lab to learn learn, learn from. So that, that, um, that farm, greenhouses, the experimental going chairs, those are all classrooms. That's all part mm -hmm. of the learning the students have and the gardens are looked after by, you'll meet Ryan, uh, Ryan Cullen here shortly, but by Ryan and a team of students. And you know, so we've had a few years to, uh, to work the kinks out, to realize our vision, to grow it and to, to gain respect in the industry around where we want to go with urban agriculture. We have three quarters of an acre of land, and last year we grew 9,000 pounds of vegetables. Wow. So we believe through um, high, high production, small parcels of land, regenerative farming, and practices that, uh, that help the ecosystem and, and allow people to produce food locally is going to have a significant impact. And of course, COVID, of course, just put a larger mic microscope on that to realize just food insecurity and security is so important. So about a year ago, we had the opportunity to uh, submit a proposal to the Barrett family and the foundation. And they really took an interest in what we're doing. And after quite a few visits to uh, to see what we're doing, meeting Ryan, and Ryan is our best salesperson yeah. ever to talk about the vision and what we're doing. But eventually they decided to invest in us. So we get five years to take what we're doing and replicate it. Oh. So we have a goal to replicate it in an urban setting in, and possibly in, a, in an indigenous setting and then, and, and then help those communities take it over, help them understand what we're doing, help what they can do and what they can do as a co-op or they can do as an organization or a community to grow food and how they can get a high yield out of a small piece of land. And of course, technology is, is adding to that too. We have greenhouses that also provide production. And we just recently brought, bought a, um, a growing chamber. Uh, again, Brian can tell you what it is, but it's hydroponic. Yeah. And we can produce 600 heads of lettuce a week. That's incredible. All vertical farming. It's controlled. It's low water. Um, it's artificial light. And the, the lettuce is spectacular. And you're seeing this all over the world, right? High production, greenhouses, um, a hydroponic, aquaponic, and, and systems to find new ways to produce food inexpensively, locally, bringing down the transportation costs, and, and, and also providing freshness, especially if you get into some of the northern communities where yeah. your transportation is a major issue. And if you can help people replicate this, there's, there's a, a true social benefit to what we're trying to do. So again, I mean, the bears are investing in us, in us and we've got some benchmarks to meet along the way, but we're confident that we're going to get there. Wow, that's incredible, so exciting. And I think I might have a, a not exactly an urban center, but uh, one of the previous guests of the show was Merlin uh, Racinos, who's the mayor in Aglulik, Nunavut. 
Mm -hmm. And Merlin runs a small outfitter uh, operation in a glue lick. And, um, and he was saying that's one of the big challenges is getting the fresh, fresh food in. Yeah. Um, during the summer, the, the, a freighter comes once in a while and they have to ferry the food back and forth, but most of it's coming by airplane. So fresh mm -hmm. has been cost. But hydroponics, uh, in an, an indoor growing uh, environment, could be done anywhere. And they're all shipping containers. They're shipping wow. containers that have been retrofit, and um, and, and it's, it's possible uh, to do things. And I mean, I grew up in I grew outside of Thunder Bay, and mm -hmm. so I used to fly to a lot of the remote uh, indigenous communities, out of Wapiscat and Sandy Lake and places like that. And it's an issue. It's a real issue trying to get fresh, affordable food. And so yeah. we can help communities uh, learn how to do this, develop the systems, and, and support it. There's definitely a social benefit to those communities. So that's one of our goals. And again, also taking it and replicate it within a within a um, uh, an urban setting, and to demonstrate that we can do it again, that it's not yeah. just one off, that we can actually help people replicate this, and then start a conversation uh, nationally and hopefully internationally with a bunch of partners of, around urban agriculture. Yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, like best best of luck with that. Now, mm -hmm. just stepping back, well, actually, way back when uh -huh. you were a kid cutting the lawn and weeding. Did you ever envision this path you'd be on to be president of, a, of a, one of Canada's biggest uh, post-secondary institutions and then leading something like <laughs> this uh, is, is super, super exciting. Share with us a little bit about that, uh, that path, that journey. <laughs> yeah, I cut a lot of grass growing up as a kid too, by the way. My father owned small apartment buildings, so I cut a lot of grass. But, okay. you know, my mother, my, my dear mother who passed away about a year ago. Oh, she, I'm sorry to hear that. She, yeah, <laughs> she lived a good life. Um, she used to say, I can't believe who you are because I, I wasn't a really good student in high school. I was a bit of a hellier uh, through my, my teenage years. And she sort of just said, I can't, like, how did you do this? So I had no idea that I was going to be in the position I'm in. I started my career in retail and owned a men's store on my own um, uh, when I was what, 22, 23 years old. Yeah. And I went bankrupt at 29, so I lost <laughs> everything I, I accumulated. Uh, but then I knew I had to find a different path, and I was given an opportunity at Federation College to be, of all things, a small business consultant. A man that just lost his business, right? Yeah, don't do that. Being asked by the dean at the time, like, what are you going to teach these people? I'm going to say, I'm going to teach them not to, to make the same mistakes that I did. But yeah, and so I've been on a path for 35 years with the college system, and what a wonderful system! And not, I mean, Durham's fabulous, but the entire college system is an incredible mm -hmm. system in Ontario. It's you know world class, but. And I know you mentioned teaching. I used to teach part time, but I always enjoyed the administrative. Mm -hmm. And so I've been an administrator for most of my career. And, um, you know, like anybody else, you're looking to try to advance your career. And I was given the opportunity to come to Durham as vice president academic, which was short lived, about 10 months. And then I was asked to step into a vacant role. And uh, and it's just been such an honor to, to lead Durham. And we've done so well over the last decade. We really have. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but, you know, success comes by building a great team and also by having the community behind you. The communities in the Durham region are incredible, the way they support Durham College on every level. Mm -hmm. There's a program advisory committee, which you're aware of, our, our athletics, I mean, our foundations, people are stepping up the plate all the time to help us. And in return, we're trying to help them as well. But yeah, it's been a fun career path, a yeah. lot of fun. And uh, um, I, I love being around here. And, and my children have followed me here my grandchildren are here and uh, we all live within, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes of each other. Yeah, that's wonderful. And as and as a coach at Durham, it's uh, it's a super easy school to recruit athletes to come to. You know, the sports is outstanding. But, they, but as I said, the student experience, the academic support, the the high level of, of employ, employ, employability. Yeah. My graduation, uh, lifelong friends, um, you know, a, a, an awesome campus that even has, it has a lot, as, as we said, the greenest, um, one of the greenest employers. And can you tell us a little bit about that, Don? Because I'm, again, I'm really interested in, in it both from the personal, like the human perspective, but the mm -hmm. landscape and the system, landscape system perspective as well. And I guess they probably measure all of those um, characteristics. Oh. It's quite a comprehensive application process that you go through. And, um, you know, even back to the Center for Food, when we had the vision for Center for Food, we hired Janet Rosenberg, 
out of Toronto, a landscape architect, and she painted a, a vision for us, mm. which took us five years to realize, but we're finally at that point. But part of that is also uh, respecting the land, you know, local plants, local trees, uh, regenerative. And so she put that vision in front of you. We worked with Jamie Kennedy around sustainable agriculture, sustainable mm. restaurants, uh, but also as an institution, we've made a huge um, investment around our systems, our technology systems. We recently just um, converted a, um, a piece of land that had a, the old Simcoe building on into a geothermal. Mm. It helped reduce our GHC, GHG um, by 25% wow. on Oshawa campus. And so every year we make investments to do our part to try to reduce our admissions. And but it's also important to get students involved. So we do have grassroots committees through our uh, our Living Green initiative, where students also sit down and talk to us about what they want to do. And, mm -hmm. and so we've had, you know, recycling programs from students, um, and we look at how we recycle technology. So it's a whole, it's a system, not a system, it's a college-wide effort. It's not just one part of the college. It's the facilities people, the IT, the grounds people, and then our mm -hmm. academics. And it comes together in a massive application in which get we get to recognize as the uh, one of the greenest employers in Canada. It's been six years in a row now too. I'm very proud of that. Wow! Yeah, that that's a, that's a real uh, a huge accomplishment. Congratulations on that. Thank you. So, Don, are you growing your own food at home? You know what? I grow herbs at home all the time. Okay. Uh, every year, uh, tomatoes, herbs. Good Italian boy. You can't have a, a garden without some tomatoes, so you can make some fresh pasta every year, right? But listen, I grew up. My my grandparents are Italian. I grew up where the backyard was a garden, a yeah. massive backyard, and was a hundred percent garden. So uh, it's uh, it's in my blood. And my son's a chef, and he also grows all his own herbs. So. Uh, yeah, I know it's something I truly believe in too. This, the Center for Food and what we're doing and what Ryan's going to talk about with our, and what Ryan and his team has brought to the college, it's just spectacular. It's a vision that I, I would never realize because I didn't have enough knowledge to realize what, what he's talking about. But it's it's really a, a labor of love for all of us, truly. Yeah, that's amazing. That was supposed to be the segue to bring Ryan in. Perfect. And uh, I see him here, but I can't bring him in. Uh, it looks like he he was he was on. Oh, here he is. Uh, he was up in the greenhouse, and uh, he didn't have the best signal up there. So we'll we'll see if we can bring him in. Ryan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can. You're you're a white dot on a black background. It's the best I can do today. My com my computer doesn't seem to like my face today, so you're gonna have to just put up with my voice. Okay, well, we'll send us a photo and we'll uh, we'll Photoshop you into the uh, into the into the broadcast. I absolutely thank you, will, Mike. Thank you, Ryan, so much for joining us. Don has been uh, sharing with us some of the the background of the Barrett family and the the mm -hmm. Center for Food that that you're the the field supervisor for. And uh, like first off, Ryan, um, what is the impact that this donation is going to make to you and to the what you're doing at the at the center? Well, I think it's huge, really. Um, it, it really justifies everything that we've been doing here for the last five years, as Don said. Um, we've been really working hard, and it has been a labor of love uh, for me particularly, but I think it really um, helps us showcase better you know, what we're doing, our, our small-scale urban agricultural model, um, these high-yield production systems that we're demonstrating. I think it's really going to give us an opportunity to do some things that we weren't able to do in the past. Um, it's going to allow us to replicate our model. It's going to allow us to share with the community. It's going to allow us to take it off campus um, and, and work with some partners to develop other pieces of land, to spread our, our ideas and our concepts and our processes and procedures. And I think really make an impact in the community. You know, Don mentioned food security, um, you know, city planning, um, you know, and, and just re reusing some poorly used land that, that every municipality and every area has. So I think in, in that case, we have an opportunity to make some really big impacts and affect more than um, just our community at the college. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Don had mentioned some of the technologies that uh, that you've been employing or, or thinking about or maybe just have acquired. Can mm -hmm. you share some of those with us? And, and, I, and I also share with us the um, the ability that other places are going to be able to integrate them. So a small city or maybe a, a small village up north, way up north, we talked about Aglulik and Nunavut. 
Mm -hmm. uh, just like, and, and that's what I'm really interested in as well. And this is the thriving mayor show. So we want to try to tie this back to how mayors can be, um, you know, access this, this uh, intelligence, this process, this equipment and, you know, obviously, yeah, you know. absolutely. So, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the technology we use and some of the systems we've been developing, I like to say they're applicable technology. So they, they fit our context, you know, as Don mentioned, we have a three quarter acre market garden, you mm -hmm. know, we're, the whole farm is on you know a little under two acres when you add all the greenhouses and some of the other production systems and so we're really trying to demonstrate what you can do in this in an urban farm context you know lots of r d and technology has gone into you know large-scale agriculture we got autonomous tractors that can cultivate thousands of acres you have right. you know thousands of square footage of high-tech greenhouses um and not a lot of, of r d and 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 innovative tech has gone into the small scale, especially urban uh, farm context, you know? And so we have some really cool features, you know, last year um, we, we were able to add uh, a freight farm, which is that vertical hydroponic uh, farm in a shipping container. So it, it's basically a repurposed shipping container, which are ubiquitous around the world. You can easily get them. Yeah. Um, this one's an off the shelf product, but once you learn um, how it's built and how it works, you know, you could build them yourselves. Um, but you know, we're with something like that, we're able to grow, uh, as Don mentioned, 600 heads of lettuce a week, a number of kilos of, of greens that we turn into a, a clamshell that we sell, and it's 52 weeks of the year. So, you know, right now we're growing lettuce year round. It gives us some indoor production. It gives us some flexibility from, um, you know, field crops. And then, you know, we have a, a number, of, number of other systems that allow us to grow year round, which is super important in our climate and super important to answering um, and solving problems like food security. Um, you know, especially in Canada, we have only have eight months of growing outdoors, but it's things like high tunnels and hoop houses and, and automated greenhouse spaces and vertical hydroponic farms that allow us to extend our growing season. It allows us to put this infrastructure and these buildings and these components into urban settings because you can scale them up or scale them down to fit your context. You know, wow. and then we have traditional growing in the field. Um, we got a three quarter acre market garden that we've taken basically um, industrial soil and using no till and um, no dig methods. We've just been adding compost. We have permanent raised beds that we broad fork. We don't turn over with a rototiller. And, you know, you talk about um, technology in the market garden, we're very much human scale. And I'm, I'm literally watching for my students prep some beds right now. And, but there's also a lot of really cool, innovative technology that's gone into that small scale market garden paradigm. And so you, there's all kinds of great little hand tools um, that have been adapted to this context and to this, this, these production methods. And we're utilizing those, we're showcasing those, we're, we're taking what uh, market gardeners and farmers and urban agriculturists are using in the industry and we're demonstrating them here. We're showing our students how to use them. We're video, we're taking videos of them, we're creating content, we're sharing it. Um, and you know, this, this money from the Barrett Foundation is gonna allow us to do more of those things, to get cooler toys, um, you know, maybe some more expensive tools and equipment and infrastructure that we can then showcase, demonstrate, share with the community, share with industry, and really make our model that much more efficient, that much more productive, and something that is uh, replicable. Well, that's amazing. You mentioned in Canada we have an eight-month growing season. I don't think Thunder Bay has eight-month growing season. <laughs> yeah. Depends where you are. If you're in that southern strip, you're eight months. If you're up north, it's yeah. even it's even harder. And it really just goes to show you, like, how we need to apply some of this this technology you know the more we can have more efficient greenhouses that are scalable and modular that we can ship to northern mm -hmm. communities that can be built by local communities you know with a with a your everyday contractor or a group of passionate people that's what we need for these situations we can't have really high tech complicated systems that communities and, and people can't build themselves and so that's part of this urban egg model that i think we want to be demonstrating and replicating things that can be replicated that don't require you know millions of dollars to build um, and complex technology that can't be managed by your everyday person yeah um i well, you, I've, I've heard go ahead from, Don. i learned so much from ryan too i some of the growing methods that we have been um done even like in a small hoop house where we're we're growing tomatoes well into October and it's just, it's really something else, just a different system. So it's technology, but it's not the hard technology that think people, it's, yeah. it's basically approaches and the way that we grow things that um, they're, they're simple and they're, they're cost effective, but the yield goes way, way up. That's, that's amazing. 
Uh, I was in the food center, I think it was last year, and there was a, a small microbrewery right by the front door. Is that still there? And are they selling? I mean, after after the lockdown. That's that's one of our that's one of our, our five research hubs. So um, we have a number of microbreweries that come to us uh, to help them to develop new products. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah, so we don't oh. we don't often brew for ourselves. We do once in a while. We bre we brew a um, sweet potato stout with um, all or nothing on an annual basis, and we serve that in our bistro. But it's primarily when's that available? I'll be over. Yeah, it's it's delicious too. It's using the fall after the sweet potatoes are out. But wow, you know, it was uh, we it's it's to serve industry like many of our research hubs. And the one story that comes to mind, I think our very first success story is if you go to a liquor store right now, you can buy a non-alcoholic IPA and it's called Partake. Oh. And they actually have some other products now. And that was developed in our lab in partnership with a new company. And they're now in the LCBO with a stout with a, with a, um, uh, an IPA and also, so I mean, and, and that's what we do. So instead of companies taking their line off to produce something or experiment, mm -hmm. We can do it. We also have all the test equipment for alcohol content and other things as well. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, they brewed once, they brewed a La Visa lager for the grand <laughs> opening, but that was about the only time we got really something like that. <laughs> well, I was wondering if we could brew a Lord's lager for, and uh, and sell it as a fundraiser for the men's volley. Well, I guess all the whole athletic department, but. Listen, for a price, we'll do anything. Just like I like it. <laughs> Um, and Ryan, you had mentioned about uh, sharing this information, and I'm wondering um, this this uh, donation may help you to uh, further expand your distribution channels, newsletters, and uh, YouTube. I, like, how are you getting the word out now? How can we, uh, as as just citizens or communities, mayors, um, you know, CAOs of cities and towns, access what you're what's happening? Well, there's a couple of ways. So we've been on social media um, pretty good for the last few years. I, we run a curbside menu with Bistro. And so Bistro 67 on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook um, is a good portal into uh, the Center for Food and the restaurant, but also um, things we're doing on the farm as well. Uh, we have a Center for Food Instagram page as well, which really highlights what we're doing in the fields a lot. Um, you know, I, I'm constantly making some content and posting it on LinkedIn. We have a we have some partnerships with some local organizations like Feast On, for example, where we've been, they've given us a, uh, um, like a little uh, handheld trail cam and we've been making some content for them as well. And I think a, the, the webpage up for the Barrett Center is on the Durham College uh, webpage as well. And I think this is one thing we want to continue to cultivate um, now that we have the, the Barrett Foundation um, donation as well. I think it's going to allow us to create more content, create more videos, create more education around all of our processes, procedures, tools, and techniques we're using on the farm and scale it up to, you know, to regional, national, and international um, platforms. And I think this is something we'd like to develop. Um, uh, I'd really like to develop kind of a horticulture food and farming manual that we can give out to students and, and potentially give out to the community. And, you know, those are things we'd like to develop. And, you know, Don, you, you mentioned the brewery and, you know, I mentioned the Center for Food and the restaurant. And I think it's one thing that we do very well here is, you know, we're not just an urban farm. I think our niche and our, our thing that we do well is we really integrate everything into the whole. And so, you know, we have our horticulture programs, but we also have our culinary hospitality and events. And it's really a holistic model. It's not just the farm and just growing food. It's it's the farm to the table. It's the field to the fork. As Don likes to say, it's it's seed to celebration. And I think we do that well. Mm -hmm. It's that whole cycle of food. It's not just the growing side of it. And I think, you know, sometimes we, we can often lose sight of that because the farm is a really exciting thing. But I think it's all those processes that we take um, as a team, as a whole, to get food from the table or from the farm to the to the table and on people's plates and, and in people's and in people's fridges. And I think that is what's worth replicating as well. And there's knowledge and education and content we could be sharing around that too. Wow. So what uh, what diploma degree um, certification do the students get right now yep. that are working with you at the center? Yeah, so they there's um, two horticulture programs. It's a, it's a two year diploma. Um, uh -huh. For one, one's a horticulture technician, which is more um, your landscaping, construction, perennial trees, um, ornamental gardens. And then we have a horticulture food and farming, which is obviously more food and agriculture, food science. Um, both of them overlap in some regards. They share classes in like soil science and 
um, career development and things like that, greenhouse production. And so they leave with a two-year diploma and then we actually hire on a team of students in the summer um, when, when the programs aren't running. And so I take out a team of, of 10 to 14 students. Most of them are, are gonna be from the horticulture um, program. Sometimes we get a culinary student or somebody pretty savvy from another program. We have a law clerk student out here right now who's actually got some experience. Um, and we build a team and they work with us all summer. We pay them. They have great um, work study positions and they work 35 hours a week from May till September. And they really get an add value diploma. It's an extra semester for them. What they get is they get to see the little nuances in the field, how to prep a bed, how to direct seed. They get to go through those motions every day and do those daily disciplines and see how the season evolves, um, which is something you don't always get in your labs and coming right. on campus, you know, two or three times a week. Um, they get to live it, breathe it and sweat it out, build some character, get some sweat equity on the farm. But they also get to leave a legacy. You know, we're planting trees that are going to live here for 50 years and. Um, they get to leave their mark and there's gardens that students have developed, trees that they've planted that are going to live here for a long time. So it really yeah. add value that they get as well. There's, there's, a, think, there's, a key, there's a key to what Ryan said too. He used the word science a couple of times. And so it is a science-based program now, mm -hmm. food and farming. So students not just learn how to grow and, and they, the practical, there's a science base behind it. So they also learn about plant life and, and, and insect and, and just, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, science behind uh, food and farming. So and that's important, especially when we look at partnerships with the university and having our students go on and pathways to finish degrees. Yeah, and I guess uh, with it being obviously sustainable and healthy, ecological, is it, are, is it certified organic, or or is the is the move to become organic certified, or? So we're not certified organic, and I would say we're certified by our customers. Um, in my opinion, I don't think you need to be certified organic. I think it, it, it's a nice label you can put to to show that you are organic. But one thing that we are that certifies us is we're transparent. You can yeah. sit in the bistro and look out the windows and you can see how we grow the food. And that's, in my opinion, all the certification you need. We have people who can walk out to the field, touch and feel, walk around, see how we grow, talk to our students. Um, you know, that's the only certification you really need. We're transparent about how we grow. We do grow organically, so we could be certified if we wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think we need to. You know, we do soil building practices. We don't till. We don't spray any pesticides or herbicides. It's all organically grown. Um, and like I say, transparent, yeah. certified by the customer. Two, two things that pop to my mind, being a, a businessman, entrepreneur, landscape architect, is that I could see down the road every single municipality needing at least one of these people on their staff. And yeah, that's, secondly, that's, our, that's, our, that's our vision is, is that people begin to replicate this. We had a really fascinating conversation over a year with an architectural firm and they build large, large buildings, corporate buildings, and, and they wanted to talk about taking, instead of taking the whole front yard and having all concrete, actually put one of these systems in the in the front or the back of whether it be a high rise so the staff there um and you know having a farm uh, lead like ryan but then working with staff mm -hmm. the staff can either you know farm the land for uh to donate back to the needy um to help people with food security or they themselves can grow it for their own purposes and and really that's what the goal is can we get people to understand this and that it can be done on a small scale and larger scale, and uh, and that's part of that engagement, and part of uh, the the Barrett um, Foundation dollars is to try to start that conversation and to uh, amplify that conversation into a large audience, including international audiences. And we've done yeah. a little bit of work internationally already through our culinary program. And right. to me, to me, it's really about putting the farm at the center of the community. You know. Mm -hmm. I especially in urban agriculture, you know, and in where we live in the Durham region, you know, all these big box plazas and, and grocery stores, it's all the same everywhere you go and you have to drive out to them. And, you know, we have our farm out in the rural community, but we, you know, what we're doing here, I think in, at the Center for Food is we're showcasing how we can put the farm back into the center of the community, make it an integral part of, of where people live and play and, and eat. And I think that's what we want to replicate. And my vision is to see a whole bunch of these in, in communities and neighborhoods all over the place. That's amazing. The second entrepreneurial um, idea that I had was in, in uh, when we start to design playgrounds, and this happened maybe 10, 15 years, 20 years ago, when splash pads or, or mm -hmm. play equipment became modularized. So the, the individual designer no longer 
really design something one of they worked with the the stakeholders and the the client the customer and the 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 uh, manufacturer so to speak to come up with the plug and play uh component based on budget location size you know all of those things and wouldn't it be amazing and maybe you're thinking this is if uh, as a landscape architect or any landscape architect in any community goes in and we say, okay, we've got an acre, five acres, 10 acres, which plug and play urban agricultural module would you like to have plugged into the park? Okay. There's a quarter acre, half acre, three quarter acre, acre. Um, and, and rather than us try to figure it out, it's just like, here it is off the shelf. That would yeah, be, I, that would be amazing. I, I think you've hit the nail on the head, Mike, and I know Don and I have talked about this before, and that was part of our discussion with the okay. firm is, you know, the, the model that we're, we're showcasing here, there's certain key infrastructures, whether it's a greenhouse, a vertical farm, uh, you know, a market garden, an orchard, um, some high tunnels, indoor production, you know, buildings, a restaurant, you can take that key infrastructure and, and your garden size and your, 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 your forestry and systems and things like that, and you can, you scale them up, scale them down, and the idea is you fit it to the context. And so yeah. whatever the community needs are, whatever the size of the land is, um, whatever the site analysis kind of dictates, you can then, you know, ship, shape, shift and modulate and create something that fits that context. And I think, you know, not everyone's going to build a, a few million dollar center for food, but they could have a small little indoor commercial kitchen with a, with a small restaurant that could fit their context, fit their community. Yeah, it's amazing. <clears throat> well, Ryan, thank you so much. Um, we're going to put some links down in the show notes about uh, where people can come and learn more about the uh, Center for Food. And uh, and is it okay if we put your email in there? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And uh, <laughs> part of me, Don? Not mine. Okay. <laughs> no, we'll put your home number in. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you so much, Ryan. That was amazing. And then Donna and I will uh, finish up. Have a great day, Ryan. Okay, guys. Take care. Enjoy the rest Thanks. of your day. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. So, uh, so Don, just to kind of uh, recap, uh, what? please share with us your vision for uh, for uh, how Durham is is helping to shape and, and uh, provide these positive contributions and lasting legacies to our cities and towns. Yeah, you know, we, the, you have to look at our core business, which is teaching and learning. So our first interest is really training the workforce, mm. training a generation of young people who understand urban agriculture, or if you're a chef student, to understand the impact that you can have by growing some of your own your own vegetables and herbs. And so, I mean, that's number one. And that's part of the Barrett uh, Foundation is developing more educational programs, expanding our reach, expanding our enrollment, and getting more young people out there that understand that. The second part is about community. As I said earlier, I mean, without community, we're not successful as a college. So I think this project gives us an opportunity to leave a lasting legacy in, in the communities that we that we partner with. And from there, as you said, I mean, you know, there's modular type of things. So can we modulize this and put it in a kit and help other people realize the same thing? And we have a whole bunch of other conversations taking place with some communities that are already looking at trying to repurpose lands that have been used for other things that need to be brought back up to uh, its natural state. There are just so many opportunities and people are looking for answers. And yeah, you can't help but go back to the question about the pandemic. Yeah because the pandemic has revealed so much to us. I mean, our supply chain, our logistics, our, our, our backlog, and people are having a hard time getting certain things. Food security became an issue. And so if we can have a little wee part of that to improve in people's lives and help people out, then in my view, we've been successful. So we're a small college in Oshawa and Whitby, Ontario. Uh, and if we can have an impact, um, then then I mean that's that's what you want to you want to accomplish, right? Yeah. And then it goes back to our own value. We we truly believe that we have to continue to lead the way, and we have to make a difference. And, and that's and that's where the buck stops. And so, what can we do to accomplish that? Yeah, that's uh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Don and uh, and Ryan. And we'll make sure that in our show notes that we'll um, we'll include some links and uh, and Ryan's email. And uh, Don, if you if you wouldn't mind just staying on till after the uh, outro of the show, and I just uh, wanted to say thanks again. I want to say thanks also, Mike. Thanks for your interest. Uh, conversation questions were great. 
and uh, much appreciated. Yeah. Well, my pleasure. And uh, it's this is it's such a a fun initiative that uh, that I've I've kind of just um, fallen into that. It's uh, it's it's so much fun. Thanks. So uh, join us next week, everybody, when we have the City of Guelph Mayor Cam Guthrie on, who's going to be also talking about circular city initiatives, and that's basically zero waste, so cradle to cradle to grave, circular economies, as well as their uh, their new coil program, which is helping to uh, incubate uh, small businesses in urban agriculture and other sustainable initiatives like that. Should be a really interesting show as well. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Thriving Mayor Show. Make sure to like and share and tell your friends and colleagues. Mayors are awesome and are the change agents to enhance the quality of living for over 80% of us. Remember what Coach Wooden said, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who can never repay you. Much love and peace. Until next time.